COVID-19 can have devastating effects for the lungs. But doctors and nurses are discovering new, damaging effects every day, from cardiac arrest to kidney failure and even unexplained tissue growth. It's a, it's a trial. It's, um, it's a marathon, really. A new, more holistic understanding of the disease is emerging. Can it lead to better treatments and higher survival rates? Now, months have passed since coronavirus entered our lives, but we're still learning about what it's capable of. A disease that may begin its assault in the lungs has proven it can wreak havoc on many other parts of the body. But as our understanding increases, so does our ability to fight COVID-19. Kerstin Meyer is a junior doctor on the intensive care unit in Hanover's Diakovere Hospital. Since March, the hospital's mainly cared for severely ill COVID-19 patients. Meyer says dealing with an unknown virus was a challenge to begin with, and that she was stunned by how quickly some patients would slip beyond help. They're here talking with us, even making calls to their families. Then two hours later, we have to ventilate them. The doctors on the unit keep all patients under close observation, constantly measuring their blood oxygen levels and sharing their impressions with one another. It's becoming apparent that COVID-19 is not only about the lungs, it damages the kidneys too. They all get blood thinners. Those are things you gradually learn on the job, that it's not purely a pathological lung condition, it's something that really affects the whole body. Researchers like Danny Yonick can use that kind of experience. He says the coronavirus has little in common with influenza. A pathologist at Hanover's MHH hospital, Yannick and his team analyzed tissue samples from deceased COVID-19 patients. Their findings are staggering. We've come to realize that almost 50% of intensive care patients actually develop acute kidney failure. It's just that the lungs get to them before that does. Yannick sees COVID-19 as less of a lung affliction and much more of a vascular illness. A severely ill coronavirus patient develops embolisms or blockages in blood vessels. On top of that, within hours, uncontrolled excess tissue growth sets in. The oxygen demand is probably so great that under the stress of infection, the body tries to supply itself with more oxygen by creating new blood vessels, but it doesn't work. Yannick's findings have spread rapidly through the medical world. As a result, 12 international teams have formed to continue with the research. Does the virus cause excess tissue growth, or is it the body's final cry for help? We still don't know if the fresh blood vessel tissue, the major new discovery we've made, actually is something which is positive or negative. Is it perhaps something that shouldn't be triggered, or is it beneficial and needs encouragement? The answer could offer the basis for new ways of treating COVID-19. But since it will probably take a few more years to understand, doctors like Kerstin Meyer will have to keep a vigilant eye on their patients. Well, let's speak to Christoph Spinner. He's a consultant physician in infectious diseases at the Technical University of Munich. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Spinner. So we know coronavirus starts to attack the body via the airways and lungs, but what we didn't what do we know about its effects on other parts of the body? Well, so during the first wave of the COVID-19 pandem pandemic, we have learned pretty much. While we expected in the very beginning uh, isolated lung involvement, we now have learned that SARS-CoV-2 can already uh, affect every cell of the body. And this results in like myocard affection and many other complications that we have seen, including um, pulmonary embolism or embolism in general. And this is somehow challenging for us physicians because the variety of COVID-19 disease is huge. Is it a very different to disease, disease to what we thought we were dealing with just a few months ago? I think the answer to this question is clearly yes, because what we expected in the very beginning is a respiratory disease with primary lung involvement or involvement. And 
Pneumonia was the most common expected symptom combined with fever and coughing. But now we've recognized that many other complications, including strokes and others, can uh, severely affect patients being infected with SARS coronavirus 2. And there's much more to learn about the virus and its cause because the, the disease causes is very different from very mild to asymptomatic ones, but also patients being severely affected, resulting in the need for mechanical ventilation for many weeks. And it is about to understand what the different reasons for this is. And when it does affect other parts of the body to, you know, just the lungs, does that mean it takes greater skill to treat it? Well, to our understanding from today, we have understood that SARS coronavirus 2 is affecting the entire body. That means it is a systemic disease and not a primary lung disease. But in terms of the treatment, only systemic treatments have been um, explored or clinical studies focused to systemic treatments. While there is different categories, that means antiviral concepts, but also anti-inflammatory concepts, because what we have understood so far is that the viral replication itself is a problem, but also the immune activation due to SARS coronavirus 2 infection. And therefore, these two different approaches or combined ones are currently under investigation. And we are constantly learning more about this disease, aren't we? So is the way we treat it also constantly changing? Well, I think yes, because um, remdesivir, the first antiviral substance or drug that is available in the US and will become available in the European Union very soon, is a first step. But we have also learned that dexamethasone, a steroid that is reducing immune activity, is also decreasing mortality and severity of disease in severe COVID-19 patients. But there is a couple of hundred other drugs being under investigation and also other uh, concepts of treatment. And while the effect of COVID-19 is very different around the world, it is very clear that we will learn from the ongoing studies within the next month pretty much more about fighting against COVID-19. So how much is there left to learn about COVID-19? We've obviously learned a lot over the past few months, but is there more? Well, the speed of research we have seen in terms of SARS-CoV-2 is amazing. I've never seen such a speed in increasing medical knowledge before, but this is very important. And as the entire world is fighting against COVID-19, um, I think there will be much more novel ideas and novel aspects that will help us in fighting against this disease. Well, Dr. Christoph Spinner from the Technical University of Munich, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. And now it's your chance to ask the questions. Here's our science correspondent, Derek Williams. What's the D614G mutation? The D614G mutation is a mutation in a variant of the virus that's predominantly found um, in Europe and most of the US. And, and there's been lots of speculation. It might be linked to either higher fatalities or, or higher transmissibility in patients. Um, one study from the US that's still under peer review claims to show the mutation makes the virus much more infectious by, by stabilizing and increasing um, its number of spikes. Those, those, those are those proteins that SARS-CoV-2 uses to attach to cells. Um, but those researchers were only working with cell cultures, so, so their results don't necessarily translate one-to-one -one in the real world. Um, though other studies have supported the idea that the D614G variant is more transmissible, um, it'll take more work to find out if the mutation really does make it more infectious in us um, rather than just in our cells, in culture. Why is COVID-19 considered a pandemic when less than 1% of the world's population has been infected? 
currently only around one person in a thousand or so on the planet has been officially listed as a, as a COVID-19 case, which, which doesn't sound like much. So I understand your confusion. And, and the term is a little fluid. Um, the WHO, which, which by the way, sat on the fence for weeks in the early stages of the outbreak um, before deciding to call COVID-19 a pandemic, uh, defines pandemic pretty simply as uh, the worldwide spread of a new disease. So all it is is an epidemic, but one that's spread over a number of countries or continents and is moving swiftly and affecting large numbers of people. Um, however, the word isn't attached or tied um, to a specific number. What's the probability of significant damage being inflicted on the lungs in an otherwise asymptomatic case? The problem with trying to answer this question is the word asymptomatic. Um, it's, a, it's a very loose term. Um, but what we're discovering is that even if someone doesn't really notice that they have the disease, it doesn't necessarily mean it, it hasn't damaged their lungs. Um, in a small scale study from China, over half of these supposedly asymptomatic COVID-19 subjects um, actually had CT scan patterns indicative of lung damage caused by, by mild forms of pneumonia. Um, we'll need much more extensive research, however, to determine whether that number is accurate. And, and figuring it out is not going to be easy. After all, I mean, most asymptomatic cases are never discovered um, simply because the patient doesn't even know they're sick. So why would you scan their lungs? Um, the good news is that lung specialists are cautiously optimistic that, that in most asymptomatic patients, um, any damage that's done uh, will heal over time. 